Hey guys, in this video I'm going to be going over the basics of DVT and PE and I'm going to be going over the most common PIM questions that you are most likely to get asked on your clinical rotations. So let's get started. I'm basically just going to do this in terms of a kind of question and answer format. And so if we just want to get started with DVT, we'll start with some of the most common questions that you may be asked right off the bat. What is a triad of risk factors for a DVT or thrombosis? And the answer to that is going to be Verkau's triad. You may remember this from medical school, but this is going to describe uh, three different things. It's going to describe uh, hypercoagulable state, venous stasis, and endothelial injury. And this is a, definitely a PIM question that you might get asked. The next question is what circumference change between one leg from the other counts as unilateral leg swelling. This is very useful uh, to check in patients because it actually goes into some of our calculators for later. Um, but really what you're looking for is a greater than three centimeter difference from one leg to the other to officially classify it as unilateral leg swelling. Next, uh, what is a physical exam finding that can suggest a DVT? That would be Homan sign. And this is a, a sign that is elicited when you dorsiflex the ankle of the patient. And uh, if that elicits pain or tenderness at the posterior calf, then that would be suggestive of a possible DVT. Now, the sensitivity and specificity of this exam finding is pretty low, but it's definitely something to check because it's very easy to check. And so I include it in all my assessments of patients in general. Finally, uh, what do you consider a proximal DVT? and what is the treatment for that versus a distal DVT and how do you treat that? So proximal DVT is going to be anything that is located above the knee, whereas uh, distal DVT is below the knee. The reason this is important is if, you know, I draw a man here or a woman or patient, whatever, and they have their DVT here, uh, say there's a DVT proximally, that's gonna be much bigger and um, a much more risky uh, blood clot that could potentially travel to the lungs and cause a very significant PE. Whereas if they have a distal DVT, for example, in the smaller veins in the distal part uh, below the knee, then uh, these ones are less significant because if this one embolizes and goes up to the lung, it's so small because it's formed in those distal branches that it's probably not going to cause any real hemodynamic consequence or hypoxia or anything like that. So typically we're a lot more concerned about these proximal DVTs than we are about these distal DVTs. So what about treatment that, for this then? So for treatment, um, proximal DVTs are certainly going to be anticoagulation. But for distal DVTs, actually, we are actually moving towards anticoagulation for this as well. So it almost begs the question, like, why do we care if it's proximal or distal? Well, it still matters in terms of risk stratification, as I was telling you earlier. But uh, previously, it was thought for distal DVTs that you could do just kind of serial ultrasounds. Um, so that was previously how we would manage that. So serial ultrasounds, which is still an option if they have low risk and you think, you know, the low risk, the risk of embolizing or propagating is very low. Uh, but in general, it sounds like it's more favored to actually anticoagulate these patients as well. So that's the difference between a proximal DVT and a distal DVT. Now we're going to move on to PE, which is really going to be where the meat of the discussion is going to be. Now, this is why we really care about people who have DVTs or not. So, um, a couple of key questions to start off with. So uh, this is just such a common question that you will no doubt be pimped on this multiple times during your medical school training or residency training. But what is the most common EKG finding of a PE? The answer to that is going to be sinus tachycardia. Uh, many times people will say the next answer, which is not really the most common finding, but um, the most common, again, being sinus tachycardia, but there is a more pathognomonic EKG finding. And this is why attendings love to ask this a lot because it's kind of like a trick question. So the pathognomonic EKG finding is going to be S1, Q3, T3. And you may be asking, you know, what the heck is S1, Q3, T3? So basically what this describes is, uh, if I could draw this out, you have an EKG, right? And you got lead one and you have lead three. And I'll just put lead two here. So normally in lead one, you'll have uh, a P wave and then kind of a Q wave and then uh, a T wave like that. 
Um, and then so for uh, down here, you'll have, you know, your typical QRS complex and a T wave like that. This is normal, okay? But what is described in S1Q3 T3 is basically you're going to have an S wave in lead one. So you see now you develop this pattern right here. We have this new S wave that's developed. And in lead T3, you're looking for two findings. So you're going to look for a Q wave and an inverted T wave. So that's a Q wave in lead three. This is an inverted T wave in lead three. And this is a, an S wave in lead one. So that is what's described as S1, Q3, T3. And this kind of tells you that there's basically right heart strain or, or strain on the right side of the heart. That's why you develop some of these EKG findings in a very severe PE. So again, uh, such a common trick question, this most common EKG finding, uh, that I would definitely make sure you know this answer. Next question is going to be, what is a score to help rule out PE? And the answer to this is going to be the PERC score or the PE rule out criteria. So it's kind of in the name, but this is what you're going to use a lot of times in the emergency department to say, you know, this patient has a PERC score of zero. So we can basically say with 98, 99% certainty that this patient does not have a PE. Uh, if the patient does not perk out, as they would say, or the patient um, is you know, unable to be ruled out for PE based on this perk criteria, then there's a couple of scores after that to uh, kind of assess the risk of DVT or PE. And that would be the Wells score. Um, you can also uh, look into the years criteria as well, which is another score that you can look into as well. But basically, uh, what the Wells score tells you is, should I get a D-dimer? to assess if this patient has APE, or should I go straight to a CT scan? The most common question that people are gonna ask you is what is the correct situation to get, you know, to calculate a well score and to get a D-dimer. So when should we get a well score and when should we just like go straight to the CT scan? Again, this is gonna be a very, very high yield question that you should definitely, definitely know because this is asked countless times in residency and medical training in general. But the only utility for a well score is if you have low suspicion for a PE. This is because if you had high suspicion for a PE, you should just go straight to a CT scan. Um, say you got a uh, high suspicion for PE and then you tried to calculate the well score and it was low and uh, then it's telling you, okay, maybe you can get a D-dimer and not get the CT scan. Well, that's not useful because you still had high suspicion. You're still going to go and get that CT scan. So in that case, there's no utility to getting uh, a D-dimer or calculating a well score. So again, I can't emphasize this enough. Only use well score if you have low suspicion for PE. If you have high suspicion for PE, just go straight to the CT scan. So if we go into a situation where we do have low suspicion for PE, that's when the well score becomes useful because um, if the well score is less than four, then we can get a uh, D-dimer. And if the D-dimer is low, then we don't have to get the CT scan. But if it's greater than or equal to four, that's when I just go straight to CT scan to rule out um, a, a PE. Remember that a uh, D-dimer is actually an acute phase reactant. So if a patient is coming in with a severe pneumonia or UTI or just some other kind of infection, and you calculate a well score and it tells you to get a D-dimer to rule out PE, um, in that situation, that's not really going to be that helpful for you because the D-dimer is going to be elevated if they're coming in with an infection. So you just have to keep that in mind that a lot of times your D-dimer is going to be high and it's going to kind of commit you to getting that CT scan because, you know, the patient has an acute phase inflammation going on. And so they have uh, elevated D-dimer from that. Okay, finally, we're going to get into the main part of this video, which is actually talking about how to classify PEs. So my, my main question when I'm doing this talk for learners, this is one of my, you know, go-to chalk talks is how do you actually classify PEs? Um, there's a classification system and they really should know about it. And so the answer to that is that you have non-massive PE, you have submassive PE, and massive. Now, the nomenclature is kind of changing a little bit where some people are starting to say, you know, this is kind of confusing, you know, massive, non-massive, oh, is that correlating to the size of the clot? It actually has nothing to do with the size of the clot, but rather what is actually being affected. And so some people are, are starting to favor calling it, you know, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk PE instead. So let's just start uh, directly with um, massive PE. So what really determines if a PE is massive or not? And that's going to be if the patient is hemodynamically unstable. Okay. 
And then uh, obviously if it's non-massive, they're going to be hemodynamically stable. So what are we saying is going to be in this group that's submassive, where it's an intermediate risk? Um, there's a couple things that you need to know. So what differentiates submassive from the other two classes is that the patient is hemodynamically stable, but they have signs of right ventricular dysfunction or right ventricular overload. And so think about certain things that that may you know that may show up in when you're trying to evaluate the patient. Positive troponin a positive BNP, um, or you can see echo signs of right ventricular uh, pressure overload. For example, the McConnell sign or the D sign. So just to illustrate that really quickly for you guys, if you have a heart right here, you know, uh, this is your left ventricle uh, right here. It's kind of muscular like this, right? And uh, normally it's actually gonna be, you know, I could just redraw this part a little bit. Normally it's gonna be bulging out like this towards the right ventricle because, you know, it's got more pressure. It's, it's a stronger side of the heart. And so you get this kind of thing going on like this. Now, if a patient has right ventricular overload, what you'll see is that actually this will start to bulge into this side and uh, the right ventricle basically starts bowing into the left ventricle and this is what you'll see on the uh, echo and it'll be basically the D sign. So you can see how this forms kind of a D when you're looking at it. And then the McConnell sign is basically gonna be describing um, akinesia or basically the walls of the right ventricle are not moving very much. Imagine they're so spread out that they're like barely moving. Um, but this apical wall right here is going to be hyper contractile. So it's, it's moving a lot, but the rest of the RV is like barely moving. So those are the two echo signs that you may see that indicate submassive PE. So before we move on, I just wanna mention that uh, there is one additional score that you can calculate to calculate the risk of mortality uh, and also calculate if a patient would be suitable for outpatient treatment um, for a PE, and that would be the PESI score or the PE severity index. So that's another score that you can keep in your back pocket. Uh, but I just wanted to move briefly on to treatment at this stage. So all of these um, different uh, classes of PE, you're going to anticoagulate essentially, right? Anticoagulation, anticoagulation, anticoagulation. Every of these people need to be on a blood thinner. Uh, the, the thing with non-massive is that you can potentially, if they have a low PESI score, discharge them home uh, and just start them on a DOAC. Remember in the previous talk that we talked about the loading dose for the DOACs, um, and so that could potentially be an option for a non-massive PE. And if they are a low-risk submassive PE, Again, they could probably, you know, do anticoagulation and go and get a DOAC as well. But where it becomes really interesting is going to be massive PEs where the patient is hemodynamically unstable because this is going to be something we need to intervene on in immediately. And so this patient is probably going to get systemic TPA. But there's a couple of caveats to this. So, uh, you know, in addition to anticoagulation, you can have a patient who is a low bleeding risk and a high bleeding risk. And if they're low bleeding risk, you're probably just going to do the systemic TPA. But if they're high bleeding risk, you have a couple of other options. So you can do surgical embolectomy. You can do catheter-directed thrombectomy. Um, and you can also consider things like uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis. But this is not really that evidence-based. So basically this is, you know, they take a catheter and go directly up to that blood clot and just squirt a little bit of anticoagulant like right at that area in the hopes that this reduces the systemic bleeding risk. But to be honest, um, if you read all of the guidelines, it's not really that recommended. The evidence for it is not that good. And it seems like they still have the same bleeding risk, whether or not you give a full dose of TPA versus you do just catheter-directed thrombolysis. So um, in general, it's not that favored to do catheter-directed thrombolysis. Like I said, for submassive, uh, you know, you have your low risk category over here, which can probably go and get DOAC, and then you have your higher risk. So if you see that the burden on the right ventricle, right ventricle is higher, then you're going to be starting to think about doing more interventions, probably something like a catheter-directed thrombectomy, or sometimes people do like half-dose TPA. There's all sorts of different things there. So uh, submassive is really where the, the money is in terms of the decision-making. Um, all of these patients should have a basically a pulmonology consult uh, if they're submassive because they're really going to be helping you make that decision on how aggressive do we want to be with uh, dealing with this PE. All right, and then one last point that I want to do on the slides here is that uh, you need to know the difference between provoked uh, DVT and PE and unprovoked. 
So provoked means that there was a clear identifying trigger. Patient had a major surgery, or they were traveling and were immobile for you know twelve hours or something. If the patient has a clear provoking tra- uh, factor, then they really only need three months of anticoagulation. If they had a particularly large PE, then you can sometimes do six months. But otherwise, just do a you know finite amount of anticoagulation. However, if the patient is unprovoked PE, this is something that usually at this point is going to require lifelong anticoagulation. Um, if the patient you can't identify a reason why the patient had a PE, they're at higher risk uh, of having another DVT or PE, and so we tend to favor that. Um, there are these kind of um, fringe situations where it's uh, you know where it's weakly provoked, um, where it's like a patient was recently pregnant or had estrogen therapy or had a minor surgery or leg injury. Uh, In these cases, they also oftentimes recommend lifelong anticoagulation, but they may be able to do a time-limited trial of anticoagulation too. So uh, consider time-limited trial. But yeah, the trend really has moved towards lifelong anticoagulation in patients who have unprovoked PEs. One common question comes up is, you know, what if a patient had a provoked PE because they have cancer? Um, You know, would you only treat for three to six months? Well, in that situation, you know, the provoking factor is still there. Um, You have not removed the provoking factor. So if the patient's still going to have cancer afterwards, then you need to initiate them on indefinite lifelong therapy until the provoking factor is removed. So in that case, um, it is provoked PE, but but in that situation, you're still going to do indefinite anticoagulation. One thing that I would want to add is that there's actually some emerging evidence uh, for unprovoked PE that after three to six months, you can actually reduce their apixaban or rivaroxaban uh, dose. So after three to six months, you can do 2.5 BID of apixaban or 10 daily of rivaroxaban. Uh, This is what I recently read in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, this is nice because it's going to reduce the bleeding complications, but also still help reduce their risk of Uh, of another thromboembolic event. The important thing to note here is that the highest risk of um, propagation or extension or worsening of the DVT or PE is within that three to six month period. So after that three to six month period, um, it's a lot safer to kind of start going down and being less aggressive with the anticoagulation um, threshold that you have. And then finally, last thing, uh, just to touch about IVC filters, um, generally not going to be recommended. They don't have great evidence for them. Um, I mean, if somebody absolutely absolutely cannot get anticoagulation, then yes, uh, it is definitely an option. But uh, they have all sorts of adverse effects themselves. Uh, Usually don't want to leave them in for too long. So if a patient can be anticoagulated, do not place an IVC filter in them. Uh, It's very, very limited situations in which you would consider an IVC filter. So definitely talk to your pulmonology specialist, interventional radiology specialist to determine when that time would be. But yeah, in general, I would avoid IVC filters for your patients. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I do have another video that's talking about how to do uh, DVT ultrasounds on your own and you can just do this on your own at the bedside. So check that video out here if you're interested. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video and peace.